that's another interesting thing about about the immersion is um you have no idea what to connect with people on when you're not in your own pop, pop culture right using your own metaphors you're upside down <laughs> But it's amazing because you realize we have a lot to connect on, but it's all the stuff that I think is boring. It's like, what, like, what is manhood? You can relate to someone on that level. Mm -hmm. Or what is, um, what is courage? Anyone, anyone who's anyone <laughs> understands the concept of courage. That's right. Hello and welcome to Why Are We Talking About Rabbits? The Immersion Ship Series. That's this podcast. Today we dig into a particular concept employed by us at First Think. That's a type of living and learning we call immersion ship. Something like letting go. Something like being turned upside down using intuition to figure out deep, deep, deep underwater what the heck's going on. This is what happens to people when we put them in country and ask them to imbibe the culture. So welcome to the Immersion Series on Watar. Today, we look at the flow and what happens when you become a First Things Foundation field worker. And we talk with Daniel Paternos, your very own First Things Foundation, Daniel Paternos. So some epistemology today done lightly on Watar. So here we are, man. We see a lot of each other. <laughs> now we're doing this pod because you're one of these people who did this immersion ship. So let's just talk about it again. Let's just, let's do the premise and then we'll start talking. This is Daniel Paternos. Daniel Paternos has done this thing. So this is the immersion ship series. Welcome guys. This is a podcast about when you jump in the water and you get turned upside down. And that's what we do on purpose at first things. That's what Navy SEALs do. That's what a good office does to you when you get there and you're their secretary. They turn you upside down so that you can immerse in something like their culture. And so the question for us in this series is, what does that mean? What are the benefits of it? And how? why should we embrace it? Why should we embrace feeling out of sorts, in pain, and struggling? Why should that be something we embrace? And then our people that we bring on to talk about this will talk about how it benefited them, even though it hurt them at times. So this is, is this, Daniel, would you say this is the anti-safe space podcast? There are no safe spaces here. <laughs> We're like trying to actually talk about why we shouldn't have a safe space. Yeah. Yeah. With the proper context. With the proper context. Because right. you don't. You don't want to. You don't just people. go to an unsafe space for the sake of going to an unsafe space. Right. Right. That's not productive. Can we do this really quick? Yes. Because this is episode 100. Can we remind? Let me ask you a question. How yes. often do people ask you why the podcast is named? Why are we talking about rabbits? A lot. <laughs> <laughs> How often do you actually say what? That Z almost means? zero. Can we do it right now? Do you remember? Do you know why? It's I know exactly why. You do? Yeah, I was explaining it last night, actually. Okay. At a, at a KP dinner. Let's do it really quick. Can we? Because it's episode like, 100. Would you like, by the way, episode 100, Andrew, music or like a cheering crowd? <laughs> Can we do that? Woo! <laughs> like all the people listening are like, gosh, they have these lame. How did they make it this far? <laughs> <laughs> so you want to do it? Yeah. Okay. Why so, are we talking about rabbits? Why? So we were making this podcast. Remember that? And I think I just returned from a, a trip to Georgia. Georgian Republic. Yeah. Yeah. And I was telling you this story as we were forming the podcast about how most most nights you're in Georgia, you're you're having a KP, and it can be as casual or as formal as possible. I, I haven't told this story for like two years. It's been since like episode one. We got to remind people. Okay, good. So we're having a KP. It's me and Zviad. In a KP, you can have like three people, and it's fine. Yeah, yeah. And you have Cha Cha, and and my friend was visiting from the Cha Cha States. is moonshine essentially, but really good, delicious moonshine. And it's okay. You don't like cha-cha? It's just rocket fuel. No, nah, but it tastes good. All right, go ahead. So I'm standing there with Zviad with cha-cha in my hands. Zviad has cha-cha and my friend from the States is visiting, right? And we're, you know, toasting, but it's very casual, very casual. Mm -hmm. And um, and uh, there's kind of a pause in the conversation. You know how Americans try to fill space 
Yeah, yeah I do that. I do that. I you do apologize that a lot. For that. Yeah. <laughs> is that what your podcast is? Is filling space in the internet? I blame my mother. But... <laughs> <laughs> So he's trying to fill space. Ah, by the way, that's true. <laughs> so, you can think of the podcast is I hit record and there's just space. <laughs> it's just, just babble. All right, go ahead. Whatever. So so my friend, he's like looking around. I think he's getting uncomfortable. And he's like, he, he just so he tries to fill space with my friend's Zviad. And he's like, Zviad, a frog in America says ribbit, you know, like ribbit, ribbit. And, and I've traveled to Russia, says my friend. He's like, in Russia, they say, I don't remember, skra. Right. He's like, what do frogs say in Georgia? Like, what, what's the sound that the frogs make? And my friend Zibiad looks at me and he goes, Daniel, why are we talking about the ribbit? <laughs> <laughs> this is right. And I, I told you the story. I love this story. And so that's what it is. It's like the Georgian, we talk about the KB all the time. Yes, the all the time. But it's not, I think Georgians recognize the power of words, the power of logos in a way that we don't. And so your heavy things lightly is like everyone's either going too heavy or they're just throwing away their words. That's right. So what's the in between space? Heavy things lightly. Yeah. And to add to that, I always say the ribbit, the rabbit on the internet is also the thing that we chase around, which actually is the thing of less meaning right, then say the mother or the father of the rabbit that was born. Like we should actually talk about the origins of these ideas mm. in a way that's deep. And so why are we talking about rabbits has this, this double meaning, right? One is, is slow down, and like, like Zviad was saying, slow down, be at peace, have a drink, yeah. and don't worry. <laughs> Secondly, that's the light part. The heavy part is, is dig down on the good stuff. That's what happens at the super table. Yeah. If you look at the themes that are being offered by these Georgians at this traditional dinner that we do all the time at the restaurant, they're not, they're not like the New York Jets lost last night. They're heavy stuff, mm. but they do it the way you described. Like, mm -hmm. why are we talking about the ribbons? Yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah, guys, that's important to remember. That's what we're doing, right? And now we've done a hundred. Yeah. So could we actually start with the KP? Can we get into that a little bit in terms of the immersion, in terms of jumping into the deep end? Okay, so let me do a formal thing. This is Daniel Paternos. He's the executive field director of First Things Foundation. You've done a number of things in the last three or four years that are profoundly immersive. Yeah. Start a restaurant, profoundly immersive. You And you went to Sierra Leone, learned Creole and Mende, profoundly immersive. And you did projects with people who, let's just put it this way, they're on the fringes of what we call modern society. And so immersive. So that's why you're here. And that's what we're trying to talk about in this series. But mm -hmm. yeah, go ahead. What do you want to talk Maybe about? I'll ask you questions too. I don't know. No, we go back and you forth. Immersed in your life. Well, just marriage, which you haven't done. <laughs> I've done I hear a lot from you. Talking about, about being upside down. <laughs> yeah. Do you get scared as a single person that marriage is just some sort of torture chamber? It's I not. I do. I do. You do, right? Yeah. There's a lot of that talk. Why though? Because it's true. <laughs> <laughs> or the torture is like if you're sweating it out okay let me have, put it this way you play basketball you hit a famous shot like you won like regionals or something okay your dad told me all about it <laughs> so <man. laughs> it's on video of like a half court shot and then you were like a champion i think they carried you i think it was a disney movie no stop i think it was stop. are you zach <laughs> efron disney movie. you're zach efron <laughs> 17 again <laughs> so anyway if you're sweating it out and you're running r these rat races and you're sweating it out and it sucks, that's a torture chamber of sorts. Mm, yeah. Right? Yeah. You put yourself in that. And that's what I'm talking about with marriage. You chose to enter it. Right. I think you, cho I think, you think you chose to enter a lifelong limousine on the way to the wedding ceremony. I think yeah. everyone thinks the limousine just keeps driving for the next 40 years. Mm -hmm. Like, no, you get out of the limousine. <laughs> the party's over and then you live. Right. And it's a sweat box on some level. Yeah. Then that scares you. So let me ask you this. Okay. Why do the sweat box of marriage? I think it's for the reason that we're doing this series. When I get turned upside down, when I have to fix, I mean, it happened literally just yesterday where I was looking at one thing about the restaurant. My wife attended a super last night, a, a KP. And she saw one thing, she saw the dinner one way that was quite complimentary and nice. 
But I didn't see it that way, and I we got into a fight. Not a fight, guys, whatever, you know, the thing. We, we got into marriage. And I said, that was less important than this. And it happened to be with the, the heat in the place. It, mm. It's too hot. She was seeing something real that I did not want to embrace because I wanted her to embrace my perspective, which is like a thumbs up, way to go, we're the best. And if I did that from 26 or 29 when I got married until 55 right now, if I just did thumbs up, way to go, I'm the best, and there was no wife around, that's a really jacked up, what yeah. the, what life did I just lead? Yeah. That's nuts. If I just, Or what if you just did thumbs up while your wife is around? We just fight all the time. It would be over. No, you would just dissolve. Yeah, we couldn't. You, we couldn't. You're like, no, you're right about everything, right? Yeah, like we the, could. The fight is necessary. It's right. It's yeah. not. Now, the problem is people here fight in 2022 in diverse, quote, you know, I don't know, happy America, where everyone's mm. trying to become happy. They hear fight as unhappy. Mm. I think that's the same way that you can't. Do you think that's why the UFC and bloody boxing has become so popular in the sense that it's like an outlet where people actually return to something like their normal human man self? <laughs> I think so. Something like that. I mean, you do that, right? I mean, you. Do I don't some, do MMA. You're not on TV, but no. you, you do jiu-jitsu. I like jiu-jitsu. Is it a refuge, even though you're getting your arm like torn off? <laughs> there, that I think that is an aspect of the extremes of our culture. There's so much comfort being shoved down your throat. And like the baseline understanding is that you're an American. You should be happy. You should be content. If life is hard, then something's wrong with life. Right. And I think people run to challenges. Like yeah. people run to the Marine Corps because they have this intuition. Like anyone who grows up, grows, <laughs> grows up with suffering. And you're like, how do I deal with the suffering? Right. My culture has no way of explaining if this can be redeemed, if this has any purpose at all, if it's just Neil. So I think people run to um, suffering in a way to try to figure it out. So your service in West Africa was first things. Was it, I know you, it was part of that. Mm -hmm. Right? You went into the upside down, which by the way, it's, it's very ironic, right? The, the movie Fight Club was made. Stranger Things is about this upside down world. Mm. And there is this weird desire for something like the hard stuff so let me ask you you got it you got the hard stuff i mean there were times like tell us about some times when the immersion was really really upside down and can we do this yeah because like i think in marriage you were saying you you get hard stuff and then you just can't like it's unresolved and people will get divorced it's like the, the unique thing about first things is that there's hard stuff, the hardest stuff. I mean, it's insane. What, like how much can you, malaria? You what, did, what did Ozzy just have? Ozzy just had, um, he had, um, you mean Gabriel? No, Ozzy had it when he was in West Africa. He, he had not tuberculosis. What did he get? Uh, no, typhoid. Yeah. That typhoid. Don't drink the swamp. Wait, water. you had typhoid too. Um, I don't know. Maybe. How do you oh. test? Yeah, that's a problem. Um, but here, the unique thing about first things, and we'll get into immersion, the unique thing about first things is that there's already a precedent. There's a purpose for the sacrifice that you make. Right? Mm -hmm. There's a, there's an understanding that you're making a sacrifice, of course, for, for some sort of growth and personal development, but also for the sake of other people. And Correct. so in marriage, you're making a sacrifice. That's right. You're setting aside your dumb ideas or... Your pride, your singleness for well, <laughs> working that, for your wife, um, okay. and well, so and, and so when when you trained us to go to West Africa, if there had been no understanding that the sacrifices that you make, the upside downness, will be for the purpose of being able to connect with people and That's build true. and understand yourself in a deeper way, then man, you just get lost. You get really lost. I think there's that no we tables. see that there's no reason to be there at that point. Right. Wow. But I have a question for you because you did Peace Corps yeah. in Mali. Mm -hmm. How many how many people just got flipped upside down and just like twirled out of control because there was no precedent? Wow. So there was two types of twirls. I yeah. like that question because you saw two types of people. And then there was a third, but the first type of person when they got immersed, now you 
you're talking Peace Corps. Peace Corps does it right. They, we went to some pretty hardcore places in West Africa, in Mali. The first person rebels against the, ter- the twist, goes deeper into their Americanism, puts on a pair of boots and an American hat, and just goes straight to the rational project building phase. Mm. They're like, I don't want to know about your language. I don't know about this, but you guys have dirty water and I'm going to fix it. Mm. They're, like, they're like a fixer-upper guy. They have like their control zone. The total control zone. And anything that touches their zone turns into them. Bingo. Yeah. They they have, there is no bleed okay. into the culture. Right. I Some of my dearest friends there were just those guys. Right. They would work, 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 go to the city and live American life uh-huh. and then go back out to the, to the village and like, but they didn't have like best buddies. They just had work. You know what I mean? The other kind, when they got turned upside down, these are the two, what I would call the two extreme. The two unhealthy extremes. I don't think that was healthy when people did that. The other one, and by the way, I could be wrong. The other twist, and you saw this too, is some of these cats will go all the way to the end. That's you. That, that, that was more me. <laughs> Put on boo-boos yeah. and, and start like learning all the, the Arabic that was proper for the mosque because we were in a Muslim country. They would just adopt every aspect of the culture possible and start to dislike Americans. Mm-hmm. Like literally, like we would sit around and go, look at this effing American. Mm-hmm. But we were that. So we were trying to lose ourselves. I was definitely mm-hmm. on that end, which included deep, deep language because the language was the proof that you weren't an American. Mm-hmm. So the deeper you got into language, the more that the Malians would accept you and the mm-hmm. more you could find shelter in their culture, right? I think there's a proper balance between the two. Can we, can we name it? The, the proper balance? Because I just gave a talk on this. Yeah. I think the proper balance is hospitality done properly. What do you mean by that? Hospitality is something like the KP table. It's, it's, it's the outside meeting the inside properly. Right, right, and right. So you're an outsider going to Mali, and mm-hmm. you have two choices. You can, either, you can either be indifferent and just be like, well, screw this. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm making this place American. Right. Or you can become Mali which is dangerous in and of itself. Totally dangerous. So I think hospitality is somewhere in the middle where another way to put it, someone knocks on your door, right? If you go to the left hand, you just say, no, stay outside. You're just right. not hospital at all. But then there is another extreme. Bring them in, I don't know, chain them to yeah, your table. You take them up to your bedroom and show them around. <laughs> spoon feed that. You can't leave until you recite the here's creed. Right. <laughs> like, right. And totally lose right. yourself. Right. Right, right. You defile the sacred space in some ways, mm-hmm. or in a marriage, like like you don't you don't turn your wife into you, and you don't become your wife. There's an exchange, and in the exchange, well, this is God meets. This is God became man. Man meets man can become God. This mm-hmm. is Saint Basil, right? Mm-hmm. Or is that Athanasius? Actually, that's the concept of the proper uniting, because I don't become God in the truest sense, but I participate in a way. And this is in the Christian East. I participate in a way that I become like God, but I also don't stay perfectly united to my material manhood. I'm supposed to leave that in some ways, right? Mm. Not not in a Gnostic way, but I am supposed to elevate. Right, right. The parts of you that can be redeemed, let's say during baptism, the moment, are are flipped are are redeemed like right. like you don't your personality isn't diminished or destroyed when right you when you attain theosis right and in the same way a proper immersion mm-hmm. is gaining yourself i call it gaining the right side up but within so again the metaphor is you jumped into the water and it was a long jump in other words you get so deep in the jump in other words you get underwater far enough that you first have to gain your wits. Yeah. Now, if you don't jump from a high enough space, then you don't even go underwater. Mm. That's not immersion, right? Immersion is all the way under. Again, this is a bat. It has a baptism iconography to it. Mm-hmm. All the way under, turned upside down, and then you don't shoot right for the top. You stay underwater long enough, open your eyes, and realize there's an ecosystem here, and then you become aware of that. Now, can you breathe under there? I think. Now, now again, the metaphor is sainthood. The saints start to breathe in a place that feels like they should die. That, like that's, that makes my hair stand up. Yeah. Because now they're like, oh, I can be here. Now, yeah. they're going to go back up because they're mortal. Yeah. But now if they come back up properly after having spent enough time under, 
they come back up with an awareness of both realities. They know where it was, how life is, where they jumped from, but they also realize that place is not scary. It's real. And now they can see things. They can see. Now, if I were to walk you up to the shore and say, you know what's under there? Just beauty. And you would be like, I ain't jumping in there. But they know. Yeah. Because they experienced it. You know what paradigm that destroys? The what? grass is greener paradigm. Because explain that. I think I know where you're going with Can this. Can I do a story? Yeah, yeah. So there was, um, I met Father Comey. Do you, do you meet Father Comey in Sierra Leone? Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. He's the one that invited us to uh, Kailan. The Catholic priest. Catholic priest. And um, wonderful. He just says it as it is and like has all of these wonderful, rich African parables and stories. Mm-hmm. And, and he's Catholic. He's kind so of a hard ass, flipping. too. He's a hard ass. Yeah, yeah. totally. Uh, but I, so a year in, I guess you could say I was really flipped upside down. Mm-hmm. I had been back to the States once really excited and like relieved to go back and it, like it made everything worse and i was so confused and i was like i don't know where i am let me go oh i remember I just these go. phone calls yeah we talked a lot yeah I, it was, but i went back to west africa i was like john's telling me that i don't know that there's a purpose to all this let me just give it a try like who knows i mean i was confused out of my mind though and, you were you were you were having a classic moment yeah and and um I remember, so so Father Comby invited me to Kailan. Remember, he had these widows groups. Yeah, yeah. We still work with them. We work these with co-ops. Them. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and all the women saw me, and you know what happens when people who have never seen a white guy see a white guy, or maybe they've heard of them. Yeah, but they literally have not met Europeans. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But but they know. I mean, there's a civil war. There's the UN relief, all that aid. They and hear so about it. They're yeah. like, this guy. Is his skin money? Like, is, is oh, yeah. this guy just you dripping? Just, you just, a bank walked in. Yeah, a bank walked in. And man, there were like tears. Like, he introduced me, and I'm just like standing there and just like ripping me with questions, begging me for stuff. I was like, oh my goodness, this is really. Yeah, I met those same groups, yeah. And, and Father Kobe, you know, he like made me speak to them, explain what I'm doing there. And I could speak Creole by this time. Um, and, uh, and he's kind of like, he's letting me sit in the in the chaos of, yeah, of yeah. this he's kind of just like watching observing how i'm doing and then i don't know after 15 minutes he comes to my rescue and so this is a story that he told so he said that there was a there was a boy i've told you this who was born in kailan and kailan's like a farming town cassava bananas I mean, guys our work out there is in the sticks you think like i don't know kentucky's the stick. but it's the it's the bread bread bowl or whatever yeah, bread basket, basket, it's yeah. so it's so bread basket it's rich like right. they're like three corn seasons like straight <laughs> like jungle rich. the joke is if you drop a phone in the ground the next day a phone tree, will grow. <laughs> phone tree. <laughs> <laughs> but but sierra leone is known for if you've seen blood diamond it's known for the minerals it's known for their you it's know, a rich rich it's a mining town land. it's a mining country but not in kailan and so in kailan it's all farming and so the story is that this boy was he was born in kailan very poor and um when he was eight years old he saw his family struggling and so he decided i want to do well for my family so he moved to kono kono is the big big mining town Mm -hmm. about i don't know 10 hours drive Um, that's the town you guys all know if you watch the movies that it's a really important mining town in in sierra leone so he goes to kono and he starts digging for diamonds for years 10 years goes by 20 years 80 years he dies he dies in Kono. He right? dies in Kono. He dies okay. in Kono digging for diamonds, doesn't find anything. So his family goes and they bring him, uh, because in, in Sierra Leone, you, you're always buried in the backyard of your, your father's house. And so they have multiple tombs of all their ancestors. So they brought him back to Kailan to give him the proper burial. And as they're digging his grave, guess what they hit? Diamond. The massive, this massive diamond. <laughs> Father Combe, and he's telling this parable to these women as they're asking me for all this stuff. He's like, before you ask that white guy for anything, consider what's in your own backyard. This dude. So let me tie this in because the grass is greener idea. I was like, is he telling that to me too? <laughs> because by the way, yes, guys, like in Freetown, and things were hard, and I like left the U S in some, in some way, because I was like, think like the, this culture is off. Um, maybe Sierra Leone is what's up. Yeah. Yeah. And then I moved to Kailan and, and when he told that, I was like, huh, 
maybe there's something to be said for being turned upside down in water. Maybe there, maybe there's something there. So, and can I add something about that? Cause we were working together, mm. dude. I don't know what happened to you, mm. <laughs> but that actually was manifest in your life because the, the dude who was about, you were about to go home. I think it's fair to say that that was one of the options on the table. My parents wanted me. Home. Yeah. Yeah. Your mom definitely was like enough of this stuff. That dude who was real and honest and out of your safe space, I, I didn't see that guy anymore. Mm. Now, I'm not trying to say that was a bad person. I'm trying to say that that part of you got burned off or something. Now, I think that's the point of this process. Anybody who's been married for any amount of time knows that's what's happening to them. They're leaving the old man on some level, mm. which is, it's proper, I think. Mm. Stop right there. Let's let's cut in a break and then let's come back in just a second. Okay. On our immersion ship series at Watar. First Things Foundation is scouring the world. And you are a part of the world for excellent sponsors, folks who want to get the word out about what they do. For a very fair price, become a sponsor of Watar. And in fact, in so doing, You'll be assisting First Things Foundation in developing small projects around the world to serve local communities. Check out our website, www.first-things.org, and give us a call or write us an email if you'd like to be a sponsor. Your ad appears here, and that ad helps us help others. So, so, So if you follow the diamond out, the concept is, is that every person everywhere, even those most isolated and impoverished in, in, in this crazy modern world, this colonial world, they have diamonds in their backyard. Is this a self-help message for you? I don't hear it that way. I, mm. I don't hear it like bootstraps. American, pull yourself up from your bootstraps. The, the Africans I know in Mali, they do that every day. I don't want to hear about that. No, it's not that at all. It's not that, it's not right? It's not like if you would just suck it up. And, and you know this. I actually want to, I've never asked you this about Mali. Um, when you greet someone in Sierra Leone, it's Kushe in Creole, Boa in, in Mende, BCA. And, and what these things mean is, um, thank you for your work. That's what they told me. Uh. So like, hello is just, Thank you for your work, John. Right. And so I say this because it's not a, it's just like individualism is so not a part of the culture. It's so foreign to it because yeah. it's, because they can't even imagine what it's like when, when I, when like they feel the work of their neighbor happening. If you're a, if you're a farmer and you, you're sick for a week, you have malaria. I feel that because oh, suddenly oh. I'm not getting my cassava when I go to the market to buy it from you. 100%. And if I'm like the village medicine man and I'm, I don't know, traveling town, you feel it. Yeah. And so when I, when I greet you, I say, thank you for your work because I understand that everyone is tied together. Yeah. Yeah. No, they, they would definitely, there were phrases that have usually the way you said way to go. You're a good person is you, you a hard worker. Mm. So they'd be like, you and your work. That was one of the phrases. But it didn't mean work. It meant like, oh, this guy's awesome. Hmm. Any barake, you and your work, dude. But you might have just been drinking palm wine. But the implication was, is the work was essential. This is what I never understood. This is one of my upside down moments in Mali. When I realized <clears throat> the things I had been taught about the American reality, and by the way, not running it down, but lift yourself up by your bootstraps, you know, uh, achieve something for yourself using your own wits. That always implied something like laziness. Mm. The flip side of that was those who don't are lazy. It was just a classic red or Republican retort to anything economic, right? But when I got to Mali, what I realized, and when I see Sierra Leone and travel there, and when I went to Mozambique for our new site, which, by the way, we're looking for two good field workers to come with us and, in, and, and enjoy and participate in this immersion. But This fall. This fall. Yeah. Guys, we're ready to go. We need two good people. But what I saw in Africa was nobody's lazy. <laughs> 
You don't see lazy. I mean, you might. It's the classic village idiot. Every now and then you would have one or two guys that just didn't fit in. They were probably mentally ill, what we would call mentally ill. They would call them sort of spiritually infested in Mali. But they were taken care of. Even they were taken care of. But the idea that the flip side of raise yourself up is laziness, that that's not a concept. No. It's not. Now, were there lazy farmers? Sure. And people would pick on them. I remember one of the guys whose field was always like kind of weak. You know what I mean? They like yeah. they used to say he doesn't have seed. <laughs> but what they meant is, is he's impotent. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. Andy doesn't have strong babies. You see, it was all tied in. Yeah. They used to make fun of him. His name was Drisa. Huh. And but Drisa also had the most powerful wife, mm. Mumu, in the village. And this is a village of, you know, maybe 150 families. Like I knew them all. And Drisa would make fun of because he doesn't have seed, dude. But he actually didn't have kids because his wife. Well, can I tell you the story? Yeah. I got sidetracked, but I want to get back. Drisa and Umu were my two favorite couple. They were, because they were familiar, they were the most modern looking couple. But I mean, Drisa hadn't even gone to college. I don't even think he'd even gone to high school. Like these cats were not like what we think of as Western. But Umu was strong in a way that I recognized from American women. And so I gravitated to them and they would sit and talk with me at night. They were fun. Mm -hmm. They didn't have kids. This is a sad story, but it's super interesting. Everyone thought it was Umu who couldn't have kids because mm. that's the way people think. Because there's something barren. Well, it turned out he went and got a test. Oh, wow. Yeah, he did. And it was him. And guess what happened? He fled. He ran from the village because it was too hard for him to be the one who couldn't have kids. Wow. And he became shamed. And they got, quote, they didn't get divorced because that's not really cool. But they broke up and it broke my heart. I love that couple mm. a lot. But Drisa was seen as sort of weak, but he also was seen as weak in his fields. Like mm. he was, but guess what? That didn't mean he didn't get to eat. That didn't mean that he, he participated fully, but he was known as that, as that. But if you were to say to him, pull up your bootstraps, otherwise you don't eat, that kind of thing, never, no, that would not be allowed. And I don't know that that's sunk into our culture. I know growing up, I heard bootstraps as some people are lazy and that's why they don't eat. That is not a West African concept. And that's part of the immersion there is to realize that. Well, you know, this, the St. Paisio story of what is heaven, what is hell. Tell us. It's the same, it's the same situation. You have people sitting around a table. Hell is when it's, it's kind of a weird story. Everyone has a very long spoon. Right. Oh, I love this story. I know. And there's a pot of food, and and hell is when you you try to use the spoon, which is longer than the length of the arm, to eat yourself. Right. <laughs> and you can't. You, you, you can't, just you never can't reach it. And heaven is when everyone's sitting around and they're feeding one another. That's the answer. And that's very West African. Like, like the amount of time I'm talking to Jake and not and um, Gabriel all the time. They're like, these people really take care of you. Like, if you're sick, and it happened to me all the time. Like these women are like. Daniel, can I bring you? Can I bring you some process? Can I bring you some food? Do you need medicine? It's just natural, and it's not. Yeah, they're like, no. Why would you say even thank you? Like, I just, I'm your neighbor. Like, I do that. So, what parts of the culture? So that's an upside down, and then you wait, awaken to that. I did. I loved it. What parts did you awaken to that you thought, okay, I'm underwater. I see this, and that is actually not that beautiful. Mm. Maybe what part of that old world wake up was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Mm. What did you have? Would you? So have, this this is a midway answer, and it ties into what I was just saying about people just naturally understanding the tie between them and helping one another. What happens when you're the you're the white dude is ever like you're a celebrity, a and it's exhausting, it's so exhausting. Totally, 100%. And if you ever want to know what being a celebrity is like, go to West Africa. You'll you'll learn. Then you'll feel bad. You'll feel sad for Brad Pitt. <laughs> yeah, really? really? No, yeah. I know. I, I think I know what you mean. <laughs> yeah. Um, but what happens is it's not only celebrity status, but it's rich man status and, and rich men in the U S are just resented in like, you're like, that guy's just rich. Like what a dick. Yeah. Right. Right. In Sierra Leone, it's like, you're rich, which means you give me things. By the way, this is fascinating. It's really interesting because it's almost like, like we have this dumb paradigm in the West, which is capitalism, socialism, right? Or capitalism, communism. Right. And, and both imply a governmental system of control mm -hmm. 
in West Africa, you could say it's like uncontrolled socialism, maybe. Because I realized after a long time, it wasn't just my skin color was the reason why they would ask me for money or ask me for help or, you know, want me to be their friend. I realized they're doing the same thing with all the paramount chiefs, the same thing with people of status, the, the heads of the household, the doctors and the families. If, if your brother is a doctor and you have two other brothers, two other brothers, <laughs> sorry, they're not working that hard. They're no, not doing but they get the money <laughs> because it's implied like, oh, well, we have a brother who's doing really well. Like right. He's going to be giving to us. And the brother who's doing really well, like he's going to do it because it's just how it works. This is I'm not saying it's good or bad, but um, it was difficult to come to that realization that like I'm not that special. It's just like maybe I do have an obligation. <laughs> so some sociologists, political yeah. scientists in America will call that class. Mm. But I had a hard time mm. with that. In my deep immersion in West Africa, in, 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 definitely in Mali. Mali is a more structured Muslim country than Sierra Leone, where you guys worked. But I've been to Sierra Leone many times. There's a lot of similarities. The most fascinating thing is what you said, is it's already been determined that the reason that you became rich was to give. Mm. You're not rich because you earned it. You're rich because the focus or the attention of wealth is on you because of your blood, because you got the best fields from God. There's a lot of reasons you may be it, but it's not relevant to the fact that now you give. Mm -hmm. And you and I walked into that situation thinking that it's fully because we're white. That's definitely part of it. Mm -hmm. But we're like because a, they've seen white people before. It's right, not just an arbitrary. Right. right. It's not arbitrary. They and they also, whenever they see an American movie, they notice. Wait a minute. They all have air conditioning and nicely, <laughs> like you know, like drywall. Right. You know what I'm saying? And you're like, well, they must have a lot. So we get all that. But the deep part of the emerging conversation is, is when you scratch, you realize that's what real. And I don't call it communism. I call it communitarianism. That's what real communitarianism looks like. The impulse is already in the people who have already as imbibed the culture. They're not deciding to give. They give because it's the outcome of the, how they were raised. Mm -hmm. It's who they are. And I find the angriest Americans today who want the most community, it's an ideological imposition on the culture. You have a billion dollars. You should be giving. But Bezos, or pick the person who has a billion, they've grown up in the exact opposite ethos. Should we do Roe v. Wade right now? <laughs> we should do Roe v. Wade. <laughs> it just came out. <laughs> On this, I, we don't. We shouldn't get into it. But it is interesting to think if if a policy is completely anti culture, because I don't think our culture in America is necessarily all rooting for Roe v. Wade. So if a policy, keep going. I see where you're going. It's the I same. mean, I mean, the question is, how are you going to implement that? Or what, to what extreme are you going to Im implement anti-abortion? So what let's be do? really clear. You're making a distinction that if you try to implement a type of communism or communitarianism, mm -hmm. let's, let's leave communism out. I love communitarian. When it's a natural thing. Distributism. Distributism, subsidiarism, I can't say mm -hmm. it, but it's the same. If that was natural to American culture, I think we'd have a better culture, personally. We'd be poorer. But anyway, just to stick to your idea. To force people into a mindset right now to become communitarianistic, let's say, could have some really bad outcomes. And you're saying that 51% or whatever it is, uh, opinion about Roe v. Wade is now being reflected in the Supreme Court. And now this 51%, let's just call it that, is now going to inflict this on the other 49%. And it's not an something inflection. Like, I mean, it's the, the decision up to the states. Right. But at the end of the day, it's like, how, how um, much force are you willing to use in your policy for something that's good? This is the great question. So some people would argue this. Now, we're going to sound like people are going to come at us right now. You ready? <laughs> I actually didn't want to go to Ruby. But but let's just do it for one <laughs> second. And then we can, we can, we can, we can right. do something else. But we, I, we got one other question for you. Just do it for one second for me. Because as a historian, many people argue this is why we had a war with slavery. Mm. Is that the majority was beginning to understand that this slavery of the South was actually out of the, the bounds of any type of even Protestant Christianity. 
like, uh oh, we've been told a lot of lies for the last 150 years about what's happening to Africans in slavery. And we need to wake up to this, right? We being the majority, great majority of Americans, Southern and, and Northern. But what happened was, is as that awakening was happening, you could argue it wasn't, but you had these very, very powerful Eastern bred, Northeastern bred um, abolitionists with a very particular Christian voice that comes right out of the puritanical Northeast of the of Boston settlement at the time of the Puritans. This voice became the voice of the, how should we say, the easygoing 57%. In other words, the 57% who now wanted to abolish slavery was being led by this 19% of loud, screaming abolitionists. And so every time everyone was like, well, let's look at this, the abolitionists would go, one more day of this, and you are all going to hell. And eventually, the politics became so polarized that they had to kill each other. Mm. They just... They had to, because you couldn't say like slavery's wrong, and also maybe there's another way. You'd be scumbag, loser, scumbag. You're a scumbag. You don't care about people. I probably would have been one of those. I'm just saying I would have been screaming and yelling about it. I'm not saying it's good or bad. This Roe v. Wade may be a similar story, which is I don't know any Orthodox Christians or really anybody sort of in the traditional Christian storytelling narrative. Who's like, yeah, let's just give it a couple more years. Like, they can't talk like that. <laughs> yeah. It's just like another 1.3 million dead babies. Yeah. You can't say that. And you shouldn't say that. But what's the other alternative? 500,000 dead American grown men because we mm. fought a war about it? Mm. Whoa. I don't know what that's got to do with immersion ship. <laughs> <laughs> Can we get back to the thing really quick? The whole idea of yeah. why this emergency. Do we still have a podcast now? Is it, <laughs> is it, should we just start over? No, no. Do, do, I, I don't know. Andrew, the don't cut subject? that. Hi, Andrew in Russia. Can we change the whole paradigm of why are we talking about Ravage? <clears throat> no, no. Keep going. So. Why are we talking about Roe v. Wade? No. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew, laugh track there because that was actually funny. Um, um, so I like this. I like your idea of the immersion series. Because our, our sort of tagline with first things is that creation begins with sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And it's a it's a principle that I'm not studied in many religions, but certainly it's like the cornerstone of orthodoxy. It is what the mother of God is. Mm -hmm. Thou who without corruption gave us birth to God the word. Mm -hmm. Without defilement. So the idea is that the mother of God did not seek after worldly pleasures, worldly right. pursuits, and became the pure, the most pure receptacle to receive the creator. The creator into creation. And while be call, being called a whore in the world. Yeah. Because she didn't have a husband. Right. Right. So so I think I like your idea because if you ask people what their the sacrifices or the immersion that takes place, and if they if they've come out of it, if if they went into it with hope, and if they went into it right. with the idea that there's something to be learned or gained on the other side then this pattern will emerge of, of creation that begins to sacrifice. So I like what you're doing. It's cool. And, and can we well, tie into the first thing? I like that you did it. And we're all doing it. Well, I learned from that. Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah. No, we all do, though, man. Yeah. And this is this. I think that pattern takes place. In, it's a potential for every human life. Everyone who does something called expend energy has the potential to do it in right order. Mm which is, I think, this way that you're describing, mm -hmm. which is to take the hit in order to, well, a seed has to go into the ground and die before it can come out of the ground. Mm -hmm. This is how it works. Yeah. It's like the reality. Uh, I was at this conference in LA. Do you know Father Maximus Constus? Yeah. Mm -hmm. He had this funny line. He's brilliant. Um, he said something like, you know, scientists are discovering something these days. They're discovering that actually, um, the process of death takes a long time, a whole lifetime, in fact. <laughs> you said that? It's really good. Well, like, like no one gets out of this thing alive. And the whole orthodox concept, at least, is that you defeat death by death. And, and a sacrifice is required of you to become truly human or truly divine. But then, but then look at the implications. 
You defeat death by death every day. Mm. That's what marriage is. It's the defiance of death machine. Mm. Because through the death of your ego, year after year, you are defying death in the way that you becoming an intern- eternally acceptable being. In other words, uh, my spiritual father used to always say, you're going to be known in the world to come the way you're known in the world. So if you die a little death to your ego for 50 years or 12, if you die at 12 or 70, then you're becoming acceptable in the next world because that's what the next world physics looks like. The physics of the world to come look like destroying death through death or through humility. So if you become more and more humble, you actually start to participate in the world to come now because you're becoming like the thing which you're meant to be, which is wild if you think about it. It's like jumping into the water, recognizing the world there, but then seeing even deeper in the water another hole or another passageway. And passing through that death into like the ultimate place of life, which is nuts if you think about it. So jump in now, acquire a little bit of the understanding so that when it happens to you, this, this worldly death, you're, up, you're, you're right side up. And here's the other thing that I love, he used to say, and God can smell you. Mm-hmm. Think about that. And I love smell because smell feels like we're not in control of it. You, you, like... Sound like God read the book that you wrote. God can see the muscles that I built. (laughs) Like I went to the gym 12 times a day, you know. No, no. You just smell, dude. Like that's just you can't yeah, you can't manipulate your own smell. (laughs) God just goes, God God just goes and just smells you. And you're like, no, but hold on, let me fix that. You're like, nah, that's just cologne, bro. I already smell who you Mm. are. You know what I mean? And I think the process of immersion ship Mm. is acquiring a smell. It's being able to sweat properly, you know, mm. and like that's good sweat. And then that, and I, I think there's something so cool to that idea. I don't, I don't know that it's a rational idea. But. So I have a hunch. I have a hunch that when you created first things, you didn't realize. <laughs> you had no idea how I don't know in line it all was. I think. You, <laughs> well, peace score. You got lucky. Is what I'm trying to say. Dude, 100%. <laughs> <Come on. laughs> no, you got to understand. Yeah. The parts and pieces of this thing are Peace Corps and then working in Georgia with IOCC, but then also getting married. You have to understand getting marriage is all in the same process. Mm. And then having kids, watching a wife struggle to actually birth a child is uncomfortable, dude. And then kids are the worst for me. Anyway, I I struggle with ages zero to three. You hate kids? I love kids. I love kids. But for a person who loves the ideas of life, like you, you're going to struggle too. A little one-year-old, a little two-month-old is not talking to you about the ideas. They are like the idea. They are the actually manifestation of struggle for me. It was hard. Mm. Like, <clears throat> so what do I do now? I used to hold Georgie. Georgie was the worst. And because I started to get nervous, I would sweat. <laughs> and then she would feel my sweat and start to scream. She's like, this dude's sweating. Yeah. And then I would try to like, Fix it, but I couldn't. She almost ha- it's almost like she's smelling you. It's the like same. You can't, you can't. She smells literally my arrogance and, my, and she smelled it's my like, selfishness. It's like, it's like bees. The Sierra Leone taught me that. If you know, if you know that if you go around a beehive, they can like sense you. They, they sense if you're nervous. Yeah. And, if and you're then nervous, they want to bite you. They come out and sting you. Yeah. <laughs> they're like bullies. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they're like bullies. By the way, which may not be a bad thing. That's another conversation. So how would you leave this? I think. Can I say something? Yeah. Because I think you got lucky with first things because for me. But there's a lot of people the, involved, not just me. But it's the. Um, I would not have under, kind of even close to understanding some of these patterns without just getting lost in it and then in all these things happening. But if you think about the, the three things that take place during Lent, prayer, fasting, almsgiving. Each of those is a sacrifice. Yeah, yeah. And each of those sacrifices is necessary for our work to take place. That's right. And I think um, you took this risk because what on earth were you thinking starting a nonprofit? Like, there's no, there's no, it's not a business. It's, there's, there's no income. But you did the most old world thing, which is saying maybe, maybe individuals 
will not only sacrifice to go overseas, which you'd experience, but maybe individuals will keep this thing alive by sacrificing <laughs> their their resources, their time as board members. Yeah, yeah. First things wouldn't exist without sacrifice from all these different kind of parties. Yeah. Of course, I mean prayer. Like, I didn't. But it's the. It's just. But go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, I was just gonna say I didn't know what prayer was until I was turned upside down. Like. <laughs> This is actually but again, doing something. Again, for the rational modern mind, prayer is the ultimate being. What am I doing here? Mm. I'm trying to quiet my mind. That's the biggest muscle I have. Mm. That's how I was trained for 30 years is to think like a mind, to think like a rational doer of ideas. Like I, I always joke, the best phrase for Americans is doer of ideas. They, they take an idea and just do it. They're not even putting it up against the community or putting it. My idea, done, victory. But then you look around and you go, yeah, way to go. You built all these massive, like, industrial suburban parks. And now look at the people in them. Yeah, you built them. But how is everybody doing inside your little, <laughs> your little mouse houses? Like, how's it going? Yeah. <laughs> That's a little scary because there's, there's idea, then there's doing it, and then there's also spiritual reflection on outcomes. I don't know if we do a lot of that. Do you ever feel bad for the, the founder of Arby's? <laughs> No. Like like, I have not felt bad for you. You never thought about that? <laughs> First of all, when's the last time you went to Arby's? <clears throat> Do people go to Arby's? People? <laughs> or just want to apologize right now to anybody who goes <laughs> so to Arby's. Sorry. By the way, I have good. gone to Arby's. And you yeah. know me, I'm a sucker for bad food. Me too. Are you? Because of the price? Because Chick- first Chick-fil-A things doesn't pay you? That's fine. <laughs> Chick-fil-A. By the way, I think Chick-fil-A is the place where everyone goes like, this isn't a really a fast food place. Yeah, like, yeah, that is. Closed on Sundays, John. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they are closed on. I do think that was a brilliant thing. Like, a brilliant advertisement. You know what? It? They're like me. <laughs> Chick fil A is they're thoughtful. I'm also closed on Sundays, <laughs> which is not even true. <laughs> By the way, can we take it easy on that? Because where is your position on this? Yeah. I mean, this. When your mom gave you birth, she, she like, threw you in from a high cliff into a pond called America. And then you got used to it. Great question. And now we really, we really shouldn't be so dismissive of it on some level. It is our environment. It's the one that gave us life. So it's easy to joke because we, in some ways can, we got out enough to look back. Mm. Everybody thinks they got out though, bro. Mm. Have you ever noticed? Everyone's like, America's falling apart, mm-hmm. left, right, center. But what should we be thankful for? Probably everything. Everything, right? I, I think the same thing that happened to you and Molly happened to me, which is I was like, I'm going to be Sierra Leonean, and then they went <laughs> and spit you out. Yeah, well, I spat myself out. I was like, whoa, this is, this is not what I expected. Right, right. Um, well, they spit me out. They used to tell me this. Oh, the crocodile you, thing. Yeah. Halini yorobe tojiko no atesika bamba And they would add the de at the end, which is like, you can cut cut this out, Andrew, which is like, F- yeah. <laughs> which is like. We had that. We. That, that was we. That or, uh, um, yeah, go ahead. But basically that was even if, so I was speaking bamba to them. And well, I'm just going to say it. Now, not so well. And your Creole is jamming. And so when you speak that local language, not the colonial language, man, you get kudos. But I kept telling them, give me more kudos. Because it was a, we would play around. You guys can't, I understand that they would say like little stories about birds. And I knew what they were saying. And they would go, I got you guys. And they would go, even if a stick stays in a river for a thousand years, it never becomes an alligator. And that was Mm. literally the last sort of conversation I have with Bakri as I'm getting on my motorcycle. He's Mm. my best friend there. To leave, he was like, don't worry. I was crying like a baby. Mm. Oh, I'm going to cry right now. I really liked it. They took care of me. Oh, beautiful people. But as I'm leaving, I'm crying. And I'm like, I don't want to go. He goes, Halini Yorobe Tojikono. He's like, don't worry. You're not an alligator. Go, go. And I was, oh, I rode away on my, just just crying. It was cool though, man. It was really cool because he's right. Now that doesn't mean we don't have a union as a human being, you know, in our hearts. We're 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 of one. Yeah. Well, that that's the hierarchy, right? 
we're we're one person at the highest point of attention where God has created us alike. Yeah. But we can't deny the differences. That's another interesting thing about about the immersion is um you have no idea what to connect with people on when you're not in your own pop, pop culture. Right. Using your own metaphors. You're upside down. <laughs> But it's amazing because you realize we have a lot to connect on, but it's all the stuff that I think is boring. It's like, what, like, what is manhood? You can relate to someone on that level. Mm -hmm. Or what is, um, what is courage? Anyone, anyone who's anyone <laughs> understands the concept of courage. That's right. Um, and that's, what, that's for me, what happened in Sierra Leone is I can't, I can't tell you about the latest TV show. And I can't, and I can't can you relate to like your farming methods because I'm so Oh, I used to joke about that. Method. Did you joke about this in what? your, in, in your deep immersion? This is, this is like, we would always joke about. So this is a rural village with no electricity, no running water, two years. And this was in the nineties. Peace Corps was, they stuck to their guns. I respect that organization, even though now I don't know if I, as much, but anyway, love them. Thankful. Wonderful. So I'm out there for two years and I would stay out a lot in the village and I just remember when I would see a stretch like on the calendar where I'd be there for two solid months without going to do a project or anything. I would just think, oh, my God, because every night I would get invited over to Umu, Dries's place, Bakri's place, and they would set out the chairs under the stars. And that was awesome. And they would brew tea. And then they would talk literally about one cow. Yeah. <laughs> Like, what do you think is going to happen with his foot? And yeah. I'd be like, they'd be like, I don't know. But I remember what happened to old Dries' foot. And, <laughs> Jesus' cow. And they'd go, yeah. I would be like, what happened to Dries' cow? I could have cared less. But I would like play along. And I'd be like, so what happens in the, in the rainy season? I don't know where we're going to put him. I don't know. And then they would be like, what about the fences? Do you think we'll have enough wood for And I'd be like, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> this is so boring. <laughs> Dude, and it would be like two solid months. They're going like, Joe McGon, don't forget to come tonight. And I'd be like, oh, what are we going to talk about? <laughs> Let me guess, the weather. <laughs> yeah, right. Dude, and I tried to like, you know, do philosophy and stuff. They were yeah. just like, mm, mm, <laughs> right? Yeah. Mm, yeah. Like, I don't know about that. That right. sounds stupid. <laughs> and, then, and then every once in a while they say something that like is like the most interesting thing to you. Like. Oh yeah, and like there are the gods in the sunset. You're like, wait, wait, what? Where, where are the gods? <laughs> what? Like, no, they, they would be like the. They would. Like, there, there they are. They're they are. going away in ten minutes. Right. Be aware now. Right. <laughs> it's time for a prayer because the gods. And right. then you'd be like, wow. Then you try to talk about it. They'd be like, I don't know about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I always joke. They go, Oh, was it really nice? There? I was going like, Nice isn't the right word. <laughs> no, it was. It was disturbing in the proper ways, yeah. right? And I, I, and I also came back. I did not want to be a farmer. I did not want to live rurally. Mm -hmm. And now my wife, that's all she wants. <laughs> she, she's house. trying to do a home set. She's just oh, sort of like, come on. You don't even know she's about She's going to go to Mozambique with me when we bring two people. Did she? Yeah. Oh, she actually wants to go. Yeah. yeah, I know. I heard about that. Well, so this is our immersion series, man. And so I would say this. One thing is, is we want people who like, Watar and like this podcast and this emergency ship series, we're going to try to get guys like you to come on, not just first things, but all types of people who got dumped in the water and got upside down to come on and talk about that experience. But one reason we need to do it is, is our guys who go and do this, they got to eat. <laughs> so we're always trying to find the right supporters. And I think the right supporter is someone who loves this podcast, but also says, here's 25, here's $50 a month. Here's something to, to help. And we us. should thank the donors right now. Oh man, I'm telling you guys are the ones. Because it, like I said, it's it's this organization is fueled on sacrifice in a way that in a way that companies aren't. Like we don't have big grants. We don't have big corporate grants and I want to can I tell people about this? Because yeah. I'm doing the fun right. Yeah. Guys, we've had zero public grants. Zero. Literally every bite of plazas in West Africa has been paid for by local people like yourselves who send a little money. We've had some big donors, but they're private. They're people who have done well in life and, and see what we're doing. And if you're one of those people, <laughs> consider it. But everything's been private, which I think is not by chance. I would have and you would have taken a public grant. Mm -hmm. We just never, we tried a couple of times. It's, I think it's proper orientation um, because there's something about the fluidity of a private donation something about the love that comes through a person rather than through a, a public charity mm -hmm. i don't know 
I, I don't know, but one of our philosophies is, is to try to raise up these these local donors. Yeah. So yeah, and come hang out with us. We're here in Greenville. Yeah, come hang out. Our restaurant works. That's weird. Our restaurant works. It really works. We yeah. were there last night. Yeah. Uh, come to the restaurant. We're gonna have these things called these KP weekends, where we <laughs> invite everybody in to talk philosophy, go to the restaurant, have a Georgian dinner, and then go up to Appalachia and see some of the work we're doing. That's coming up. I hope you guys will come on that. That's a fundraiser for us. But uh, Daniel, God willing, KP journey. Yeah, those go overseas. Yeah. Yeah, we've got one in Georgia. We have a window in the toward the end of August and the beginning of September this year where we have the manpower to take any of you that want to go. Uh, we need groups a little bigger than four, but we've taken groups of five before. If five of you know or you want to, if two of you know you can go in August, September, even October, and you want to go, uh, we'll get together with four or five others. We'll find them and we'll pick some dates and we'll go. Right? Yeah. yeah, I think it's likely for this year. I know a few people. Yeah. If you guys have questions or comments. Thank you. John is going to address those in the last five minutes. Yes. Of each podcast. Every podcast now will have a a portion question and answer, but I'll, I'll do it. We won't so, do it live. So we have, a, we have a Facebook group called Why Are We Talking About More Rabbits? You can post stuff there. Also on the YouTube channel. If you post questions, comments there, John will find them. Yeah. And so let's keep going. And now we're booking. We're booking for folks who got dumped in the water, got turned upside down and realized that they could live there for a little while. So, uh, Daniel, thank you. Thank you, man. We'll hear more from First Things guys on this. Um, but this is a nice series. I want to thank Andrew, too, in Russia. You guys came up with this concept. So for the Immersion Ship series for Watar, we're saying au revoir to you and check back in with us as you'll see this Immersion Ship series just about every four podcasts, something like that, where we get a really nice guest or we do something really cool to try to address this idea, which I think is an important idea in 2022. So to you guys, Nakfam Dis.